everyone. Welcome to It's Not the Six O'Clock News. This is Natasha Rosewood, your host today. And we are going to be talking today about what is true power. Are you using it or are you abusing it? Uh, my name is Natasha Rosewood. As I said, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a spiritual coach, author, past life aggressionist, and I'm hosting these Facebook Lives every Friday at 3.30, where I interview people who are offering different healing modalities as we go through these difficult times. So if you are, are you a victim of circumstance or have you overcome your rotten childhood and risen above the negative messages that you may have um, received as a child? Uh, we all react differently to uh, what we've been through. And today I've got my returning guest, Darlene Turner, who uh, has been through a lot herself. And she and her husband, Michael Turner, offer a workshop called From Victim to Victory. And this is a way that you can recover who you really are and enjoy recovery. So because this is such a hidden topic it's a bit like the virus itself sometimes you can't see it coming coming it's silent but deadly and some abusers and there are all kinds as we shall be discussing can be very charming in the outset uh, so we're going to be discussing all the dynamics of abuse here today and trying to bring this topic out from the dark corners into the open so that anybody who is being abused or anybody who is abusing because in your own way you are also victims of your experiences in this lifetime so far we want to bring this out into the open and have it be a very um talked about topic so that takes the power out of the abuse itself when it's open out in the open uh so like i said my guest today is darlene turner and Arlene has found her, his, her hero story within the trauma of experiences of domestic violence. Through two marriages over a span of 27 years, Darlene has experienced firsthand what it's like being held frozen with fear and the tremendous courage it takes to leave. Darlene has been, been caught in the cycle loop and understand why it happens and what it takes to end that cycle of abuse. Through learning many healing modalities, Darling combines all her education in her healing work. She lives trauma and pain from the body and also works with beliefs and patterns to shift from the origin so that your life is built on a solid structure of self-love and worth. Uh, Michael and Darlene, as I said, do these workshops uh, called From Victim to Victory and give you five keys to recovering you and your inner power. So welcome, Darlene. I hope you're thank you, Natasha. There. Thanks for coming back it. again. Yes. <laughs> you just your face just lights up when you smile on the screen. It's just beautiful. So um, you know, I know that you know that true power is love, but power does have negative connotations. What are some of the ways you see those negative connotations being manifested? Well, I think um, really power, I just want to read the definition or one of the definitions here I have. True definition of power is our ability to make our own choices. Sometimes power means taking something on, but sometimes it mean, means choosing to let something stand strong. But sometimes it means choosing to step aside. Um, so a little bit around that. Uh, let's see. Power Oh, there's the abuse of power. So we see that power in, in politics uh, and that authority power. And then there's the power um, that somebody uh, personal may hold against us that we we have grown to, you know, maybe look up to. Like we have our parents that are sort of in that state of power, religion sometimes. Um, there's um, in relationship, we there may be one powering over the other. Oh, there's so much to power. It's hard to touch on it all. <laughs> I'm going to make a suggestion that um, do you think that abuse comes from power struggles? And so that's when power is being used from a I'm less than 
position rather than, you know, it's a I'm better than or I'm less than. So there's there tends to be created a power struggle between in any relationship, you know, whether it's father and son, husband and wife, siblings uh, at work, that goes on a lot at work. And then, like you said, in politics. Um, so if do you think people understand who are abusing or being abused, that they can get from that place of being a power struggle to being using power as love? Do you think that's a way out? It is, but that love needs to come from inside. Um, when we are looking outside ourselves for somebody to give us something, then that is never a solid foundation, which causes a lot of that power struggle. So you have somebody that's in that place of power, um, lack of a better word, taking it from somebody else um, so that they build up that power they have within, that feeling of wholeness. And then you have the other person that, is in this place of feeling powerless and they give their power away. So you have almost the opposite scales um, that you're talking about. And a big piece of that is really starting to realize it. First of all, when we're giving our power away, it's like, oh, I don't want to have a confrontation. I don't want to fight with anybody. So here, you're just right, right? So a big yeah. part, I think a basis to this is a really understanding that we're each brought up different. We each have different beliefs. We each have different perspectives and different views. And so giving our partner or our relationship that space to have that different view and not cause this bashing, I'm right, you're wrong, and and have that that compromise or that, that space where they can express themselves without a fight, I think is really important. Do you think it, do you think, I, I so agree with that. And, and do you think it's important, uh, as you know, I see a lot of clients, I've been doing readings for, for forever, for 40 years. And what I see sadly in everybody is that we've, most of us, I'd say 99% of people have had rotten childhoods in some way, shape or another, whether, whether it's been abandonment or um, covert abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse. Um, and so what I find interesting is some people uh, grow up and they use that as an excuse, oh, poor me, while others really rise to the occasion and overcome it. And they use that uh, abuse almost as, a you know, they come from a place of anger, but they use that anger to get what they want. So they're really using their power. There. So do you think if we all kind of acknowledge we'd all had rotten childhoods and we were all in the same boat, that that would um, help us understand abuse or even lessen it? I think it would really give us that state of compassion for the yes. other person to know that we've each been through something. And it's really coming to my attention a lot about being able to go back into those circumstances and connect to that that child and that experience that we were and bring it forward and back in because it's like a piece of us gets broken off and then yes. you know another experience another piece another piece and then we're just scrambling trying to find our wholeness or, or who we are and we feel broken and we feel incomplete and so then we look everywhere to find that piece of us that was broken off yeah it's interesting you say that because I've often looked at people and psychically felt like even though they were 33, I could see them stuck at 13. And when we get into the reading, we find out, oh, yes, my parents fit up at 13 or I was started, you know, the abuse started at that point. So you write about that broken piece. So what are you doing in that process is bringing the child forward and helping the adult in the person help uh, support the child? Is that what you do? Yeah, it's, it's kind of soul retrieval in a way, right? So th there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, I just did an exercise this morning where I used my left hand to write out what a piece of me um, has not been able to express. And believe it or not, um, it was 11 years old. And when I cut my fingers off, uh, I'd done so much work around that. But there was still this piece there of, of not, you know, given this responsibility to cut the grass and that happened. And so, you know, there is many layers to it, but I, I feel like that's one of them is just, you know, a tool to use your left hand, which is a different part of us. It uses a different part of our brain 
and we're able to communicate maybe on a different level with ourself with that way. Another way is hypnotism and being hypnotized. And another way is I, I do it through uh, theta healing and it's a healing practice that I've, I've learned. And like you said as well, bringing in that inner child and having that conversation and giving that child, letting that child be heard for one, because usually we're shut down at that age and we don't have a voice or be seen or even know how to express our feelings. So being able to give that child that we were at that time, that opportunity, and then being that one to listen and to love and to give that child that compassion. So it's powerful work. I I, I totally agree with you. And um, just so you know, darling, we've got a lot of people coming on and Steffi Taylor commented, and uh, Steffi, I'm just gonna ask you right here, if you can send us your link uh, because I lost your information and I want to be able to offer it at the end of the show. Uh, so I hope you can hear me, Steffi. Um, so the root cause of abuse, do you think it always goes back to the childhood or is it cultural or is it, uh, I'm just going to give you an example using my story just because I don't want to talk about anybody else right now, but I was brought up in a very British family. I had three brothers and, my, and a sister. So my brothers were always told, never hit the girls, never hit the girls, never hit the girls. But we were also treated as uh, we were had to do the cooking and the cleaning and everything else. So although we were kind of elevated on one level and protected on one level, we were less than on another. So do you think we could change the culture and the teaching in schools so that boys and girls are respected in the way that they should be? Absolutely. That's, you know, really the most important thing is to get to our children and to be able to teach them to stand in their own power, first of all, and to know the right and wrong and to have boundaries and um, resources to use if they are in a, a serious situation. I, I I'm highly recommend some self-defense classes, um, martial arts. My husband has really um, had all of those trainings, and I think it just helps build that personal strength and courage up. And um, I love, I just listened to a story a little while ago about, you know, being able to defer the situation as well and, and in different ways. So just giving those tools to our children so that they can, first of all, see the warning signs. And, yes. and another one is to be able to have that self defense excuse me, self-defense, or maybe it's just that deference of being able to switch the conversation or in some way step away. Yeah, because I was a uh, long time ago before, before my husband, I was in a relationship and, and I knew my partner had been very badly, uh, I'd say neglected, uh, when it, from, from the time of a baby to lose about six or seven by his mother. And Whenever we got into a situation uh, where there was, you know, even a discussion, sometimes I could say the cloud is blue and he'd go off on a tangent. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, why, what is it? What's going on in your head when you go off on that tangent? And he said, well, I'm afraid I'm not going to be hurt. And I said, well, okay. And he said, I don't want to yell at you. And I said, well, in some ways, I'd rather you stand there and yell at me because at least we're connecting honestly. I mean, not violently, of course. Uh, but what we came up with, or what I came up with, is we um, bought each other journals. And when he was feeling that way, I encouraged him to write down what he was feeling. And he would. He'd write pages and pages. And it would start out with anger, and then it would just melt into love. And it was a way for us to communicate and get through that uh, trauma that remembered, it was a trigger for him. So, you know, that was just one technique. Do you have any other techniques that, say somebody's in that situation and it's going sideways, uh, that you can do what I would call a pattern interrupt? So you get the person to switch from one set of behavior to another in the moment. Yeah, um, well, there's, there's definitely not to be confrontational because that just, just butts heads and there's no listening or understanding in either way. Um, and sometimes it, you know, if somebody is pointing their finger and accusing and that maybe it's, it's sometimes you could just say, I, I'm just going to step away and think about this for a while and I'll get back to you just to let everything defuse because that's the most important is just being able to sit down and have that nice 
conversation and work things out. Um, another thing, if alcohol is involved and you have somebody that you know is drinking and is, is liable to get violent later to, you know, avoid absolutely, you know, whether you can go to your own room before, you know, he get escalates or she, um, or go to a friend's just being able to avoid those dangerous situations that, you know, can be turned sideways. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and another way of, is a really good backup is have a friend, a buddy that you, you can just text or message a, a secret code or something that you need help that they either can send the police or somehow, you know, phone or interrupt that situation just to, you know, like you said, a pattern interrupt, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Just to anything to deflate the situation because um, I, you know, <laughs> Uh, abuse can take many forms, as we know, and there's different ways of dealing with it. And when alcohol gets involved, in my in my experience, it becomes a hundred times more complex and very difficult to deal with. So um, I know we have a video here about the different forms of abuse. Uh, so we're just going to take a look at this, and this was put on out by Global. So let's just take a look at that, and then we can discuss those. <laughs> We've got somebody, something else going on there. Don't know who that was, but anyway, <laughs> she had a pretty face. Um, so there are lots of different forms of abuse. And I, I wanted to touch on this a little bit because, you know, in different cultures, abuse by men towards women um, is, is overt. You know, uh, we've heard of the Indian brides being married because they didn't, being murdered, sorry, because they didn't want to marry who their parents wanted them to marry and supposedly bringing shame to the family. And sometimes that's, it's kind of, that's okay. It, it's a culture of it being okay in some quarters. In our Western world, I feel, which I include Europe and uh, North America and Canada, it's the, the general, the surface, opinions it's not okay but so that it gets the abuse gets driven underground and what do you you know i'm seeing that conversations like these darlene can help just to maybe encourage women or anybody who's being abused especially men by women and children to come out of the closet say and just to speak about it like the me too movement could we start a a youtube movement or something uh that uh, starts bringing people to task because it's not okay. Oh, I love this part of the conversation because, you know, in my my experience in my relationships, there was no reaching out. There was no um, extra help for me. And it was so crowded with uh, silence and shame. So it's so important to be able to just give it a voice instead of having it all bottled up inside. And, um, and whether that's just, you know, maybe it just starts writing it on paper just to get it out somehow. And, and then maybe it's just talking to one friend or reaching out to somebody else that has been through those experiences. I know there's um, at the end, we'll share about hotlines and that where, you know, you just have that space to, to let it come out because, 
<laughs> when it's bottled in size and that's causing your own issues of your own health and disease and all those kinds of things. Um, another part I wanted to just bring in, cause I think it kind of got missed on your other question was um, mental health is really failing. And uh, I know that it was last week, there was a lady killed. She brought in somebody that um, a stranger that I don't know, he didn't have a home and, or something had failed in the mental health issue. She brought, welcomed him into her home and all of a sudden he lost it and killed the yeah. younger child and injured the oh other one, God. you know? So it's it, mental health is a huge issue that is not being addressed at all. And another piece to this is when people do drink, they they invite in spirits and dark forces that can flow th run through the, a person. And when you know, and that happens, they they they're not even who they normally are when that happens. So, all of these things can contribute to this these issues. And the the system is failing us, and and we all need to speak up more about it and have more courage. And if we hear people yelling or screaming in our neighborhood, help or something, yes. call the police, you know, stand up for the ones that are getting bullied and speak yes. out. Say, this isn't right. You know, if you're at somebody's house and the husband is pushing his wife around and calling her down and belittling and, and you know, state, this isn't okay. This is, you know, this is yeah. not right. That's well, getting back to the secrecy thing, I think when there's secrecy, I, I'm not too sure which which starts, but it starts the secrecy creates shame. And I know that the abusers often feel shame. My mother was very, uh, well, she was one of those people that was alcoholic. And it's so uh, interesting that you say that the spirits come in because I swore she was possessed. And there was another energy in her. She wasn't who who she normally was at all, and there was something evil going on. So that was really, really challenging to deal with. And, you know, if you don't understand, and I had nowhere to go at the time in England because uh, people didn't talk about alcoholism. Mothers didn't abuse children at that time. You know, there must be something wrong with me. I was the one that was at fault. And I think a lot of the secrecy and the shame comes from all the quarters, whether it's the abuser doing the abusing. They probably don't feel very good afterwards at all. I'm sure they don't, um, if they have any kind of a conscience. And then the person that is abused. But uh, I was told all the time, oh, it's your fault. It's all your fault. And I think what uh, we can start with is having people step forward and having them being validated and saying, uh, no, it's not your fault. This person did this thing to you. And maybe uh, we don't know what their intention was, whether to just vent or really have power over you. Uh, but let's start validating the situation. Let's start speaking the truth about what's really going on and the statistics as well, because we know that 30% more people are filing for divorce or showing up at shelters for which there are no shelters. Is that correct, Darlene? Yeah, the, they are definitely short of shelters and resources for women to go to. Um, I, they were overwhelmed before all of this started. So I really want to um, bring attention to that and, and get a hold of maybe the news or something and say, why are we not opening up spaces for these women to go? Like, I like the army barracks. Like, hey, you got lots of houses there. Like, let's open them up. I'm sure they'll be safe there. Yeah. Or well, that big hospital they opened up in Vancouver, which they haven't used, right? Yeah. Or well, the sports yeah. stadiums, you know. Um, I, I think I agree with you. I think it's up to all of us. And I feel like it starts with words. I really listen to people's language and the tone of their language. And even if they're not physically abusing, uh, you know, it's very easy to put somebody down with a tone of voice or a look or a word. Words have a lot of power as well. And those words can stick in your head for years and years and really do a number on you. So, you know, what what would you say to um, somebody? Because sometimes abuse can be difficult to detect in the beginning. People can be very charming. My mother was absolutely charming. And everybody thought I was nuts because I was, I was not so charming sometimes. Uh, 
what would you say to somebody to warn them of the signs? I listen to the language. I listen to the, the tone and the way their attitude towards, talking about men, their attitude towards women. But I listen to everybody's tone. What would you recommend? Well, definitely um, there is that tone of belittling or putting a person down or, you know, oh, you know, you don't matter. You don't have any opinion. You're dumb. Those, you know, those are definitely trigger words that are things that happen to me. Um, and just not having a voice of saying, you know what, this isn't right. Like you said, just that secrecy and that shame and not having a voice and not feeling validated, not feeling like, you know, feeling like it's all my fault. And, yes. um, and it's so true. And it just keeps us quiet. And then especially, you know, as things progress into um, other people, you have um, maybe somebody that's in authority or trying to convince friends or family that have, you know, not seeing any, like you said, this behavior, then it's like, well, what are you talking about? Oh, you must be just crazy. And, and so it, it, Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors, and right. And I would say, I would say to people, you know, if you're around anybody and it does not feel good, uh, then you need to move away from that person. And I have met people and it got an instant, oh, no thanks, and I don't have to say anything. I just move away. But uh, sometimes I will give feedback and say, you know, the way you spoke to me, I didn't appreciate that. Did you mean to hurt me or was something else going on for you? So I will try and explore where that's coming from and, and try and uh, resolve it if it's resolvable. Do you recommend that as well to people who are uh, in married relationships, you know, to try and find to for both parties to uh, maybe look at what the triggers are? Yeah, I, I'm really into um, being in touch with our body because our body is a really good indicator. If we have that kind of scared butterfly, like feeling in your gut, that's not a good sign. If, if you're in fear of your partner or your relationship, that's a definite big um, red flag. And um, and then just that unpredictability, like we talked about, that change with an alcohol. If they're this person, all of a sudden they become another person. And you think, oh, well, they'll quit drinking or it's it's not so bad. Right. You know, they're pretty good otherwise. And I love them know, enough. They'll stop drinking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I, I am a testimony that it does not happen that way. It was only myself that had to change and, and come to the realization. And a big part of this discussion is our finding our own value and our own worth, because that's that's where it's at. And when we have never taught it, don't know anything about it of having our own personal power, our own personal value, then it, people walking on you is just your norm, right? So you don't even realize, like you said, that have that feeling or any of it. It's just like, oh, well, that's just that's just life. That's the way it is, right? Exactly. Well, I, you know, back in 19, I think, 88, somewhere in there, I did a, a big seminar down in San Francisco called Women, Sex and Power. And this man, Justin Sterling, uh, was teaching a room full of 268 women from 17 to 90. And all these women have been through marriages and divorces and rapes and murders and all kinds of different scenarios. And what he was teaching us was uh, the dynamics between men and women that we're here really to complement one another, that men are the doers and they are they're task-oriented we're talking generally speaking now and women are the social conscience conscience of society and are to guide the men to do the doing and then the men feel like the heroes being serving the goddess and the woman so there was this kind of back and forth and it's nothing that my grandmother hadn't already told me <laughs> but it really shifted my view of myself as a woman and now I think he said you know women are trying to be like men and in so doing they bring themselves down and i don't mean to i'm not men bashing there he's saying you know you you're different and you're this over here this is your femininity is your strength and when i think if women appreciated that and got that they would treat the men differently they would have a higher expectation 
of men's behavior. And I wonder if that would create a shift in the abuse. What do you think about that? Well, um, you know, if we t we kind of take the men and the women out of it and you just look at, like you say, women are nurturing, women have that intuition, women uh, follow the hearts more, um, whereas men, like you said, are the doers, the go-getters and all of that. So if, if we kind of look at it in the way that men are out there doing their shitty job, they hate, they're coming home miserable, they're they're hating their life, trying to keep up to whatever big house cars and and lifestyle that's been created and figure they're doing their part right in in creating the space for the women to be in but then you know as the women are actually rising up following our passion following our dreams it lets the men be a little bit more vulnerable and and let go of the the have to do this miserable job and maybe it gives them permission to do what they're passionate about or what feeds into them and with both of the, the male and the female in a relationship doing, working together to create this beautiful space for both of them to be in, then that creates the ha happy household. household. <laughs> yeah. um, does that make sense? Yeah, and it has to be, I don't like generalizations because uh, my husband and I are an absolute team and sometimes he does the laundry or you know, and sometimes I do something that would normally be male kind of oriented. So I think each couple has to find their their complementary place where they can complement one another and bring the best out in each other. That's my version of a relationship. Um, and he does sports, as you know, and I support him in that because that makes him happy. And he supports me in doing my work, which makes me happy. So um, I think if more couples could maybe uh, find that complementary place, whether it's male, male or female, but as long as it's complementary and supportive, then I think there'd be more harmonious households as well. But where do you think the violence comes from? I mean, you know, like I say, in our family, I didn't see that in our, from my father or my brothers or from my mother, but not from my from the men in the family. So what makes uh, it okay that one man, you know, they, they've got the same kind of maybe upbringing or scenario or earning the same thing and in the same wages, but they react differently. One reacts in violent anger, another acts as, okay, we'll sort this out. What do you think is the key there? Do you know? I think, you know, as you ask that question, it's really about having those pieces within us that are whole. So, you know, there's the, the whatever experiences that that person has had. And even though they may have had the same upgrading up, <laughs> upbringing, um, then it they still have experienced whatever experience is different. And that personality within that has handled it different. So being able to go back into that and bring in a new perspective, um, bringing in those pieces to be loved, which I know we talked about already, but it is so important. And the other piece of it is, is just being happy and fulfilled in their life. If they're miserable and hating their job, believe me, you can pick them out on the street. They got a mean look on their face. They're grabbing their beer and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, yes, you know, absolutely. how are you going to get any, any, anything out of somebody like that? Right. And it, it only takes a little bit to tip the scales. And if they, they haven't nurtured within themselves that compassion and they have that ego, I'm right. I'm, get, I'm, you know, everybody is, I hate everybody. And, and just that whole hate and negative attitude it actually feeds more into this dark energy that we've been talking about. And, and, and it, it actually um, nurtures more of the dark to come through them, which brings in that violence and that, um, and that opinion that it's, you know, it's my right. I don't care. Just get out of my way type attitude. Right. Yeah. 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 Do you think we could teach this in schools? Because as you know, I'm going to be working on a, uh, an online course, for teens and I'm calling it energy dynamics for the new generation and it's just teaching them the power of their mind about the subconscious mind about the auras their own energy and how they can make the most of their energy how they can heal and forgive 
And I'm hoping that that's going to really um, be preventative in some ways. But how do you think we can make it stop, Darlene? What, what do you think? What is your answer to that? I know you're doing a workshop, Victim to Victory. Maybe we should have that on TV. <laughs> that would be great. I would love yeah, that. Should we do that? <laughs> yes. I just see it in the near future for sure. Um, I think there's so many aspects to this. There's the video games that kids are nonstop on, and, and uh, they're just fed with violence. I, I have two grandchildren, they're twins, and they are so into this video game, watching their moms, and they're always going with swords, hi -ya, killing skeletons, and, you know, yeah, it's it's fun in games, but <laughs> you're talking three and a half. So when you start out that way, then, you know, you're just witnessing it, you're seeing it, you're embodying it, it's happening, and it becomes the normal rather than having that kindness, compassion, and, you know, not hurting each other and not killing each other. <laughs> and so yeah. that's, that's a huge basis to that. And yeah, just really feeding into what fills us up. And when we feel full of whatever it is, if it's what we love to do, you know, even nature, whatever, then that shifts this this whole negative uh, drive within people. I think it helps a lot. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's generational. I mean, I saw this in the north of England. You know, a lot of working class families that, and, and it was in the culture generally that you know taking the cane to a boy in school so resorting to violence as being the way to solve problems if you couldn't get it any other way so do you think we can start to change that culture because it's come down through the generations and some men think it's that's the way you you do things you just uh people don't listen to me i'll take a broomstick to you or whatever it is and uh, I actually stopped somebody from doing that with their two boys. He thought that was uh, the way to deal with the problem. And I said, over my dead body, you're going to take a broomstick to those two children. And he said, well, how else do you do it then? And I said, well, you let them know what they're allowed, what their privileges are, and what will be taken away according to their behaviors so that they know that there's some kind of um, disadvantage to, to not cooperating, right, but not resorting to violence. And I think we need to break that cycle. So what would you say to somebody in your workshop that's been brought up um, in, a, in generations of violence? What would you suggest to them? Well, this is where the, the five keys come in. And the first step is really tapping into our heart and, and loving ourselves. Because um, if we're looking to please somebody or be in these relationships where somebody has authority over us, then, and they have it as a fear base. And that then when we actually love ourselves, we start to tap into our value and understanding that it's, it's not okay. And then this personal uh, power that that comes from that, from our heart and from the life force that runs through us and is connected to everything, when we can start tapping into that and nurturing it, we start standing more into our sovereignty and our authority of who we are. And it's no longer acceptable to have this violence done upon us. And once we shift that, then our outer environment starts shifting and people in our relationships start shifting. If we're not giving them because they're with us, well, they're with that person because that person's willing in a way to give their power away. It's their normal, right? So it, it's, um, they feed into each other. Whereas right. when we stand up into our personal power and claim our authority, those people start falling away because you're not no longer their target. You're not their ideal person and more so people that are a match for, for good relationships will start showing up. So really your relationship with yourself is the key, most important key to start at. And then really digging in into those beliefs and those traumas and those experiences as a child, where did it start and being able to heal it on those levels so that you start feeling whole and strong and complete in your own power and um and yeah then you can come forward at life feeling that and strong and confident and i that's so agree yeah. yeah i so agree because i say to people 
um, I sometimes say there are no victims, but of course, in the moment you are the victim, right? Until you're not the victim anymore. So it's about being the pebble in the pond. It's all starts with you. When you throw the pebble into the pond, the waves go outwards. So you're emitting whatever frequency, whatever thoughts and feelings and whatever you think you deserve, how you deserve, how you think you deserve to be treated. And definitely one of my energy dynamics will be focusing on bullying and understanding that the bully, the people who bully have been bullied. And actually, if you, I, I feel sorry for them because they're trying to cover up with this kind of bravado and making everybody else's life hell uh, by bullying them. And so we've got to stop that kind of cycle. So if the person that's being bullied can stop in the track, turn around and face them and say, who hurt you? Who did what to you? And maybe start having more empathy and uh, compassion for the person that's abusing, if they're willing to grow with that. Not everybody is, of course, but those that are offering, making, making an offer to them, this is an opportunity to stop this cycle and, and to, to move forward. So, yeah, I think loving the self, I think that's the journey here in every situation. I just want to go back. We've been talking probably a lot about physical violence, but, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about how we can, people can be very charming in the beginning and those violent people can creep up on you or you meet somebody and you think, or they don't, they're, they're not an alcoholic, they don't drink but then you start to see their habits slide. Um, what do you suggest? Do you have like a, a checklist, you know, things to look for if somebody's not really aware of, uh, they're not really used to uh, what the dynamics are of, a, of, a, of an abuser? Yeah, that's, that's a, like my second husband, he was so good at putting the mask on and becoming, oh, whoever I wanted him to be. And as the relationship started to develop farther down the road, I saw that he put a mask on to portray how he wants to be to whoever he wants. You yeah. Know? So really starting to be a witness at what are those true colors underneath that that mask that's put on. And usually that's um, undercovered through, you know, always oh, get, you know, gets a little angry and you can see the, the sheer rage maybe underneath, um, but yet still kind of covered up because he may not want to show it to you just yet. Um, yeah. And, and then just how they treat other people as well. Are they being rude to other people? Are they, you know, um, oh, that guy, he cut me off. I'm going to kill him later, you know, or whatever. Right. You know, so just those comments of how they react to other people and circumstances is a really good indicator. And Big clue. yeah, yeah. Um, those are a couple, but really, you know, it, it's really tapping in being in tune with ourselves and our intuition and, and, paying attention to those signs of how they're treating other people, how they, because, you know, yeah, they may have their mask on for the first like honeymoon stage, like we talked about maybe the first year or whatever, but within that there's little signs that we'll see that are red flags. And we may think to ourselves, Oh, well, that's not too much. Like I said, or, you know, I'll, I'll change that or they'll change, but usually they, they just escalate and really start to be um, showing to you on a deeper level a little later on. Yeah. What I do hear women say is that, oh, but he's so charming. You know, when he's sober, he's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. And my, my mother was fabulous too when she was sober. You know, she had a really glorious moments. And then then that all went to hell in a handbasket. Um, and I think well, for me, uh, why I put up with it for so long was A, because she was my mother and I had compassion for her. But B, there was this hope that she'd always get better and now i say hope is the killer so what would you say to somebody who's wanting to get away but they go oh but they're so nice to the kids or they're so good blah 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 what would you say to that person <laughs> i'd say oh my god get, get out when you can i did 17 <laughs> years my first one and 10 the next and the first one i stayed because i was too terrified to leave and the second one I stayed because I thought, oh, he'll change or it's not so bad or, you know, like there's a lot of good stuff here. Right. right. And and settling for less. So, you know, make yourself your own hero of your life. And and you when you understand a little deeper, maybe of the roles people play, because 
if you look at uh, one of the shows you're watching on TV or something, everybody's got a role that everybody's playing. And when we can start becoming aware of what role we're playing, what role that person's playing, it'll start to realize, you know, your life is your movie and I want to be the star of my movie and I want to direct it into the way that I want to live my life and fill my dreams. And once we can step into that kind of a consciousness and that kind of a awareness and, and a want for our lives, everything will shift. There, it's not even an option to stay in somebody else's movie and get picked on or abused or whatever it may be happening, right? <laughs> That's so funny. I said those very words to a client this morning. I said, this is your movie and you pick the characters. So if you don't like it, fire them. <laughs> exactly, or leave yes. and bring in some new characters and go to your happy place and bring in you know the fun people uh but i do feel uh definitely the bigger picture that sometimes some of these characters shall we say come into our life to wake us up to remind us to love ourselves so on that mm -hmm. note i know you believe that true power is love so let's talk about the power of love for a while yeah, I love, I love love. <laughs> it's, too. it's got an energy all of its own and um, love can actually shift everything when we can have that compassionate love. And like you said, how can we sometimes shift energy? And it's by having that love, you know, you know, maybe just opening a conversation, you know, are you okay today? And then the person will like, no, this happened today. And, and whatever right but what if we take it at face value and it's in our face and we're just like well i had a shitty day too and you know whatever then that person is just going to come flying right back at you but if you can just have take that breath get out of your own you know head and just into your heart and just sort of radiate love and have compassion like what's going on for you why why are you acting this way or why why are you expressing such anger like what happened today just and that opens that door for that person to, oh, well, this happened. And then and then the truth comes out, right? Because yeah. so many people are not in touch with their feelings or their emotions. They're just taught to shove it down. And there's only so much you can shove down, right? You know, until you over plow on somebody. <laughs> so well, I think. I think, yeah. So I'm sorry, darling, I interrupted. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about listening. And I think abusers often, maybe many of them, feel that nobody's going to hear me, nobody's going to listen to me. And I, I feel one of the ways is just to sit and say, uh, you know, even if they're shouting at me saying, well, you did this and you did that, and say, well, I can understand how you might see it that way, and just kind of empathize and just and say, well, tell me about it, right? And get them to really communicate and just be quiet and say even when they've stopped say is there anything else you want to say and really hear them right till it's expended because i think that takes the wind out of the the angry sails shall we say right and it just lets them calm down and i think we one of the things i want to teach in my course is how to listen how to listen because uh Clients come to me and sometimes I don't say a word. They sit there for an hour and go, blah, 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 blah. And I say, that'll be $200, please. <laughs> and I feel badly because they've had to find me uh, to pay me to just to listen to them. And I get it. Like, it's, no, they just need to unload and that's fine. And then the next time they come back, they say, Natasha, I'll shut up and let you do the talking. <laughs> so it's sad in our society that we're having to pay people like our counselors and our coaches and our psychics just to be heard. When if we could do this for each other in relationship, I think that would be a very loving act. Yes. And I want to just add to that because if we look at the difference in personalities between men and women, men, you know, a woman is explaining to her man, Oh, you know, this happened today. And I'm, you know, just explaining their feelings and their experience. The man right away is like, oh, I uh, here's a fix. Here's what you do. And, you know, and right away they they go into fixing it. And that's not really right. what we needed. We just needed no. to be heard and get it out of our system. And and that's all. But, you know, becoming aware of, like I said, what roles we're playing. And also yeah. for the man is usually I want to fix it. And and so 
already thinking about the answers without actually even he caught the first sentence and it's like oh you just need to do this so not even listening to the rest of the conversation just waiting for that opportunity yeah. to get that sentence out <laughs> well even with my girlfriends i'll say you know i just want to have a quick wine right and then I'll have a glass of wine, <laughs> but it's just to unload, and I don't need a fixing. In fact, in the, in sometimes the speaking about the problem, I, I get my own solution. And sometimes I'll say to my husband, you know, I don't want you to fix me. I just want to vent. And he goes, okay, and he just sits there and has to listen to me for five minutes, and then it's done, and it's good. So I think we need to also communicate to the other person what we need or we don't need from them when we're expressing our discontent shall we say. So yeah. I think that's very loving too. So where is the support now? Because I know that the domestic violence has increased by 30%. Uh, if, if people, I mean, I'm available for to coach people. You, you've you got your workshop, your victim to victory. Do you want to talk about, have you got any lined up or where can people find you, Darlene? Mm -hmm. Well, um, right now for this show, I'm offering my PDF, which is um, the five keys that we mm -hmm. talked about, the way out, the five keys to your inner power and recovering you. So um, that um, Michael's just putting the, the link up there for us. Good. And I am doing sessions. So um, they are distance sessions because of what's going on right now. So but I can reach anybody anywhere. And uh, we can do some soul revival. We can do some of the changing the patterns and the beliefs and um, really tapping into that self love and that inner power so that that person, that client can go forward feeling a lot more whole and complete and strong and confident within themselves so that they can face whatever obstacles are coming at them in a strong. That's awesome. Level. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to start um, giving a shout out to teens. I might do something on Wednesday nights for teens or young adults specifically, just to call in and tell me their stories or if they want a reading even. Um, so I'll be talking about that. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Steffi Taylor is a client and friend of mine. And I'm with this company, it's called Legal Shield. And Stephanie, you only pay $29 a month. So if you think that you need a lawyer, you're in a situation, you need a lawyer. You don't have to have thousands of dollars. Uh, you can just contact Steffi Taylor. Her um, contact information is on the screen right now. And she's with Legal Shield, and she'll walk you through the process of joining up. And so they have a team of lawyers, and they deal with all kinds of law. And over the years, I've used them several times, mostly for about intellectual property type questions. But I've had the odd thing where I needed a cease and desist letter. So it's very comforting to know that I can just call somebody and I'm not paying, you know, thousands of dollars. So that might be another resource for some people who might be in difficult situations. Um, so and there are I think there are help numbers for kids, which I know that's increasing. So I'm I'm happy that we're uh, opening up our doors and going outside a little bit more. But I do want to say to everybody, um, please be aware that this is still out there. I'm very intuitively, I'm very concerned about a second wave. This is not coming from fear, but I think we're all starting to relax about the COVID and we're all going, oh, it's all okay. We don't need to social distance. And um, I think this is the time actually where we can go out, but we need to distance and still wear masks so we don't create a worse than before situation. And, uh, you know, on top of the violence that's going on out there and the frustration, we don't need to add any more. So just be, I want to say, considerate and loving towards others, whether you agree with somebody wearing a mask or not social distancing, whatever, just keep your own rules and keep your own space. Um, so I want to say thank you very much to Darlene. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about, though, before we leave, is your social justice program. Mm -hmm. So I know it's new, but um, because we were talking about going through the courts and lawyers and that kind of thing, what happens if you can't get the answers or the justice that you need? What's your suggestion there, Darlene? 
all thanks for this opportunity, Natasha. Um, so a lot of the times when, especially you're married to a narcissist or somebody, they are able, they have all the purse strings for one, and they're able to sway the courts and the lawyers and convince them possibly that you're not a good mother or not a good father, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Um, and when that happens, you're just railroaded in court. You don't really even have a voice. You're just so there is a group that I'm reactivating and it's called Social Justice Reform Committee. And with the group of people that I've gathered together, we're all powerhouses within this group. And we gather your names and we put them in the court of atonement, it's called, where it's handled under the universal laws of oneness and not causing harm to another. And under that, the universal laws is handled not on the earth human laws and the human courts it's handled where it belongs and justice and fairness will prevail from there and the most benevolent outcome for all happens so if if you know of somebody and would or yourself that are in these circumstances where you're getting railroaded in court please email me at Michael's got it up there, Darlene, TLC, healing hands at gmail.com. And I will take your information and your name and I'll put it forth in my committee and it will get put into the court of atonement as well as a full clearing of any dark energies that may be influencing the, the humans in this. I love this. I love this. It's like, I know there's a karma out there, but you know, I also know that when people are, sick and they're prayed for they have apparently a 50 percent better chance of of healing so i love this thought that we're doing it on a much higher frequency now and we can encourage some good karma to come back to us right <laughs> so yes. darling i want to thank you again and i think that social justice could be another another show that we can talk about another time and go into in great detail and have people's stories come in as well. So now I'm just going to say my usual shout out to all the frontline workers and uh, to really ask people to be still be very, very careful because intuitively I'm feeling there will be a second wave and how big or how small that is will depend on how careful we are now so keep washing their hands keep following the rules being keep being aware of what you're doing and i hope you join me next week because uh during the covid19 uh period while you've been hibernating you might have discovered a new hobby or a new talent or you think that you want to revamp your business and i'm going to have on caroline williamson who is a small business coach and she's got some uh amazing strategies how to take your business to the next level, whatever level you're at. So come next week and listen in and uh, let's talk about business and going big. Thank you for joining me. Namaste. I love you. I forgive you. Forgive me. And thank you. Eternally grateful to all of you. Until next week. Goodbye.